Our scripture reading today is from Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. This is the ESV version. There is therefore now no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is the word of God. Think about what it takes to respond to any invitation. Someone invites you to their home for a meal. Someone invites you out for coffee. Someone invites you to a Bible study or a small group. It starts with one single yes. Every invitation requires a response, either a yes or a no or a maybe later. There was a London newspaper did a research project and they sent a young man out in front of one of their busiest London train stations to distribute flyers. So he spent three hours one afternoon distributing flyers that said on there, just bring this flyer back to the man distributing them and he will give you a five pound note. I'm not sure what that is, five bucks, seven, like whatever, whatever that is, but like immediate free money. And you can imagine in a busy train station, most people just didn't even look at it and threw it away or just dropped it on the ground. I mean, just picture in your mind the number of those flyers that were just on the end of the flyer. He immediately handed them the cash, no questions asked. After three hours, only 11 people came back to respond to that offer. Only 11, hundreds, probably thousands of people had that opportunity in their hands and either didn't believe that it, that it was real or didn't even look at it. How often is that the reality for people today when it comes to Jesus? The, the good news is right in front of them and they either don't believe it could really be true or they don't take the time to look into it. The truth is that the invitation that God makes to the whole world, to everyone on this planet, the invitation of salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ is the most incredible offer the world has ever seen. It is the greatest of all good news. And it is for a limited time. Limited time only. You will find the gospel nowhere more clearly or powerfully presented then the section of scripture we are going to look at for the next five Sundays in Romans chapter 8 starts with verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That story of the man outside the London train station was told in Christianity Explored, which is available in Right Now Media. And it's an eight-week journey through the gospel of Mark. Pastor Rico Tice has been serving in London for 25 years, and he put that together, a wonderful resource to introduce people to Jesus. In the first episode of Christianity Explored, Rico says this, when, when you hear what you're about to hear, if you don't think it's the best news you've ever heard, you can be absolutely certain you have not yet understood it. And those eight weeks walk through the gospel of Mark and the way Jesus presents himself and invites people to respond to the good news of the kingdom of God. As we go through Romans 8, today we're just going to spend some time in the first couple of verses some of you might be daunted by that word condemnation. But let's be clear as we get started, this is, there's a way out. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And stay, stay with me to hear why that word condemnation, judgment, justice is actually central to the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, most of you know, I grew up going to church every Sunday. As soon as I was old enough, my parents brought me to Wednesday night Awana Club where I would memorize verses to win candy bars. 
My earliest association of scripture and the gospel was a means to the end of Snickers, right? <laughs> I grew up hearing about God, singing about God. We would sing about the holiness of God. So as a five, six, seven-year-old, I have this awareness that there is a God who knows everything and sees everything. He is holy and righteous and just. And that grew into an increasingly uneasy feeling, even a fear of the judgment and wrath of God. And so I did what a lot of young people who grow up in church do. At every opportunity to get saved, I would raise my hand or look at the speaker or respond to, once again, ask Jesus into my heart because you can never be quite sure it worked the last time. I later learned that that's actually not a sign of great faith and understanding. It means you haven't quite yet understood the unconditional permanent nature of a relationship with God. I reached a crisis point, point as a young teenager as my childhood sins grew up into more adolescent sins and I knew that God couldn't look the other way. And so with all of my seventh grade courage, I wrote everything down in a journal, handed it to my youth leader and ran. <laughs> he called me the next day, took me out to Arby's and for the next couple of months, helped me understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the little navigator's book we went through that had this cartoon of a little boy by the wreckage of his dad's car. And it asked the question, if you wrecked your dad's car, would he be upset with you? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but would he still be your dad? And as a 12, 13 year old, I, I knew that my dad could fix just about anything. So I was, I was like, okay, he could, I'll help him. I'll be in the garage for a long time. But I knew he would be there for me no matter what. I had lost enough soccer games by that point to know dad wasn't going anywhere with his Back to the Future camera, you know, there on the, on the sidelines. A year later at a challenge conference, I heard a preacher say this, nothing you do can make God love you more. Nothing you do can make God love you less. It reinforced what I had heard from Andy the year before about the unconditional nature of a relationship with God that's permanent, like with a good, loving father. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it because the love of God is complete. It's perfect in what Jesus has done for us. So as a young teenager, when I finally responded to that invitation and gave my heart fully to the Lord and understood the nature of that how, really how good the good news is. It wasn't that I was perfect after that, but I was armed with the resources to go through my teen years and to learn what it is to walk with Jesus. The picture for me, when it comes to responding to the good news, is a warm, early summer day when you go out to the bay or you, you go out to... A, a lake, and the water is just inviting you to dive in. The gators are on the shore sunbathing, so you know it's safe, you know. <laughs> the water is just there, and, but you have to make the choice to engage and to, to be a part of the fun of, of the day. That's the invitation that God offers to us, is to dive in to his loving embrace to experience everything that he offers us in a relationship with his son. Here's the overview of our series. Today, we're gonna to talk about the invitation to be forgiven, to escape that condemnation we all deserve because of our sin. Next week, we'll talk about freedom, not only from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin that lives in the human heart. Then we'll talk about how to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit by setting our mind and identity on who we are in Christ. And that leads us into a life of fruitfulness and significance as we walk with the Spirit and His life then comes through us in our interactions with others. And we'll see all of this as a package of then being connected with God as our Father and one another as brothers and sisters in the family of God. God's astounding offer of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Our Lord. C.S. Lewis 
says it this way in his classic book, Mere Christianity. If you want to get warm, you must stand near a fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to, even into the thing that has them. He goes on and says, once you've been united with Christ, how could you not live forever? The source of all life, the fountain of joy and peace and purpose. Once you're united with him, once you are in that fountain, how could you not live forever? But if you're separated from Christ, how can you not wither and die? Because he is the source of all life. So let's start in verse one, this first part of the offer to be forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll see there are five steps to respond to this invitation. And it starts with acknowledging the struggle. There's good and bad in every one of us. That's why the word condemnation is important for us to grapple with and to understand. And it really is part of, it's central to the good news of the gospel that our God is a God of holiness and justice. There is a day of reckoning coming for every person on this planet and they will get exactly what they deserve. That, that's actually wonderfully good news. We often present it as like, you got to understand the bad news before you can appreciate the good news. I've said it that way many times, but it's actually central to the good news that justice is coming. And we all understand that because if, if something bad happened to you and you were depending on a human court to give justice, you would not want the child predator who had abused your daughter to go free on a technicality or on some whim of the judge who said, well, he didn't really mean it. It's going to be okay. And a wink and a nod and let him go. The drunk driver who killed your loved one, you would want justice even in the small things of life. We know that wrongs have to be made right. And what kind of God would he be if in the end he just looked the other way? The truth about God is that he is holy and just in his very nature. And he couldn't change that even if he wanted to. The good news of the gospel is that though there is good and bad in all of us, and though we deserve condemnation, God has made a way for us to escape that condemnation in Christ Jesus. Now, let's go back to chapter 7 of Romans to get the picture of this struggle of good and bad. Here's the Apostle Paul saying, I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Paul, who had been a Pharisee, the most devoted Pharisee of really all of them around there in the first century, and the Pharisees were the most devoted Bible students and Bible scholars in the first century. So he, he was really probably the most zealous Bible person in the first century, and yet he said, though I desire to follow the law of God, though I desire to do what's right, I can't carry it out because there's another law inside of me waging war against the law of God, and so I do the things I don't want to do. Can't we all relate to this reality, this struggle, that there's good in us, and we know the good we ought to do that's imprinted on us in the image of God that's inside every human being, the child who's reaching for the cookie before dinner knows full well that it's not right for them to take it, but there's something in them that just wants it right now. And that's the human condition, that we are conflicted. We know that we should tell the truth, but sometimes we're tempted to bend the truth to our advantage. We know that we should wait our turn, but sometimes I just want to go first. We know that we should share our things, but often we want to keep the best for ourselves. We know that we should use nice words, but sometimes the words that come out tear people down instead of building them up. Those are the first four rules of kindergarten, right? 
Use your nice words, share your toys, wait your turn, tell the truth, right? And yet we all struggle with even these most basic things. It's not that we don't know what we should do. That's imprinted on us to know what's right and wrong. It's that there's something else inside of us that creates a conflict. So though we all desire to do what's right, we don't have the ability to carry it out. That's the struggle. The second step is to understand the reality. Because of that struggle, no one is perfect. And that's the requirement for heaven. Go back a couple chapters to Romans 3, 23. Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's glorious standard is perfection. At the end of Matthew 5, as Jesus is teaching his Sermon on the Mount, he comes to this dramatic moment of saying, it's, it's not enough not to commit adultery if you lust after people. It's not enough to not murder if you have anger boiling in your heart. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard. And yet all of us sin, and because we sin, we miss the mark and we fall short of the glory of God. That's the reality for each one of us. The gift we give to new people who come here is a little book by Andy Stanley called How Good is Good Enough. And he wrestles with that question, that common assumption in America today that good people go to heaven. Very standard assumption from Westerners and Americans in particular. Good people go to heaven. The question is, how good? How can you possibly know if you have been good enough? Because there is not a single holy book out there that will answer that question for you. The Bible tells you you have to be perfect. That's the only one that gives you an answer. There is no holy book out there that says good people and gives a definition of that. The punchline of that book and the punchline of the gospel is it's not good people who go to heaven because there are no truly good people. It's forgiven people who go to heaven. That's, we have to first understand the reality. You can see this reality even in the modern show, The Good Place. I can't fully endorse um, The Good Place, but the first two seasons actually come remarkably close to teaching biblical truth. You, you meet the four main characters in the, in the pilot of The Good Place, and Kristen Bell wakes up and finds herself in heaven, in, in The Good Place. And so through the first season, you get to know the four main characters, and Kristen is paired up with this ethics professor named Cheaty. At first, you think Chidi has all of the answers, and he's explaining to, to, to Kristen, the, the lead, Eleanor, he's explaining to her all the, the way that ethics are supposed to work. So at first, you think Chidi has it all together, has all the answers. But as you go through the first season and, and then the second season, you realize he's actually the most conflicted of any of them. As a professor of ethics, he, he is nothing but a bundle of tension, and it finally boils out, I don't know if it's season two or season three, in, in him in class making chili and filling the chili with peeps and candy. He just has a complete breakdown. It's a hilarious moment in the whole, in the whole series, but it, it proves, it, it demonstrates very visually this reality, if we can come back to the Bible now, <laughs> that no one is perfect. And that's really what season one concludes, by the way of the good place is, is that not, none of them deserve to be there and they all know it and they're wrestling with that. But that's the reality. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. What we all deserve, because we're not perfect, we all deserve death. And the final proof that we're all sinners is the fact that we all do die in the end. There's ever a question, if someone was good enough to heaven to go to heaven, then you wouldn't have a funeral for that person. In the end, the justice we deserve is not just physical death, but eternal death and separation. That's the wage that we earn for our sin. But this brings us to then the offer of the gospel. Back in Romans 8, Paul says, God has done what the law could not do. What your religious efforts could never do. God did by sending Jesus. This is why Jesus came. 
This is why the virgin birth was a thing. So the son of God could become the son of man, could live a life on earth that would satisfy the righteous requirements of the law and that could be applied to you and me through his death and resurrection. We couldn't fix the problem of sin in our hearts, so God sent his son to fix it. Jesus did what you and I could never do. The requirement for heaven is perfection. Jesus is the only one who met that requirement, who in his earthly life never once sinned, never gave in to a single temptation, lived a life of absolute, complete righteousness and love and compassion and submission to the Father's will, and then laid down that perfect life on the cross as the full and final payment for your sin and mine. God has done what we could never do for this purpose, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here's the offer of the gospel. The invitation of God to each one of us is to trade your sin for the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. I think of a young boy who's been out playing in the mud all afternoon. We were in Chicago for break and went out to play some football and it was much muddier than we anticipated, which I guess you should expect in December in Chicago. But think of a young boy who's just covered in mud. He's absolutely filthy. He comes home, his mom sees him and she's obviously like, you are not coming inside like that. But at that moment, his big brother comes out and sees the problem and helps the young boy take off his dirty clothes, hoses him down to get him cleaned up. And then the big brother says, here are some of my clothes that are clean so you can go inside. Now in that process, the older brother is going to get messy. It's going to cost him something to help. But through that exchange, the little brother is cleaned up and is made fit for the house. This is what Jesus offers us in salvation. He offers to take all of your sins, your past, present, and future sins, like filthy clothes on you, and to take them off of you and put them on himself on the cross. And in exchange, he gives you his robe of perfect, radiant righteousness. If you will just say yes. If you will just come to him in humble faith, admit your need, and ask him, to give you that gift. This leads us to the decision. You can either trust in what you can do or in what God has done. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, by the sinful nature. That's the problem of the conflict inside of us is that we're all born with a nature that is bent towards selfishness and sin. We inherited that from Adam, our first father, and only by being born again in Jesus, the new Adam, can we receive a new nature. That's what God offers to do for you. It requires you to make that decision to say yes to the Lord Jesus. Th this was the truth that dramatically changed Martin Luther's life. This is the, the truth that set in motion the entire Protestant Reformation. Luther was a German monk. More, he was very much like the Apostle Paul, more devoted than probably anyone in the 1500s to following the, the Catholic code the way of prayer and daily confession and penance and service and sacrifice and abstinence, everything that the Catholic Church required, he devoted himself to. And he was so committed that he would go every day, multiple times a day to his confessor to lay out even the smallest of sins. His priest eventually got so tired of it, he said, leave me alone until you've actually done something wrong. It culminated for Luther in a trip to Rome when there was a, an exercise that you could do that would take several hours, sometimes the entire day, and on every step of the Vatican, going up to the holy place where the Pope was, you could pray on your knees on every step. And when you got to the top, it was supposed to be the most holy experience of confession and repentance that you could do. And so he did, going to Rome. He went every step. And when he got to the top step, he stood up and shook his head and said, 
Who knows? Who knows if it's enough? All of his efforts, all of his devotion, all of his study of scripture, in the end, it led him to this, who knows? It's that problem of how good is good enough. Even when you're devoted to religion, even when that religion is under the name of Christianity, it will lead you to that place of saying, I don't know if it's enough. The lightning bolt that finally broke through for him was the phrase, the righteousness of God. He said he used to hate the term, the righteousness of God, because to him it meant holiness and justice that was coming against him, sinner that he was. But in meditating on Romans 1.17 and the rest of the book of Romans and teaching through the Psalms, he finally saw the truth that it's not a righteousness it's not just a righteousness that God demands of us. It's a righteousness that God offers us. That Romans 1.17 is from faith for faith or by faith from beginning to end. It's a righteousness God offers us by faith alone. And when that realization hit him, he said this. I felt I was altogether born again had entered paradise itself through open gates. This monk who had agonized over whether he was devoted enough, whether he was praying enough, whether he was confessing enough, finally when he understood the righteousness of God was available as an exchange to be received by faith alone, he said, I was like, I went into paradise suddenly and all of scripture then opened itself up to me and I ran through by memory and found this analogy. Look at this point. The work of God is what God does in us. Not what we do to earn his favor, but what God does in us. The power of God that makes us strong. The wisdom of God that makes us wise. The strength of God. The salvation of God. The glory of God. What he does in us. The transformational exchange he accomplishes in us. And it comes down to this decision that Luther had to make, that Paul the Pharisee had to make to trust in what you can do or in what God has done. God did this. He accomplished the work of salvation by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That means in human form, as a fully human man, to be a sin offering. That should remind us of our Jewish Old Testament when every year the Jews would take a one-year-old unblemished lamb and bring it into their home for a week. Imagine that. Every year. Like a puppy. Like you're getting a puppy. In your home for a week. And then the Passover would come and you would slaughter that lamb and eat euros. Or pork chops. But it wasn't about the meat. It was about the sacrifice. It was about the cost. Remembering the story of God and the Passover and how the people of God were saved by the blood of a lamb applied to their doorpost so that the angel of death could pass over their house. The annual tradition was to continue to slaughter a lamb every Passover and remind Jewish families the cost of atonement, the cost of salvation, the covering that was necessary through an innocent creature giving its life in exchange for yours. So when Jesus came and John the Baptist looked at him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he was reminding all the Jewish listeners of their Passover tradition, their offering of sacrifices over and over again, the cost of our salvation, the requirement for a blood sacrifice. This is what God has done presented his only son as a once for all time sin offering. What can take away my sin? We just sang. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I guess we didn't sing that. We sang Jesus paid it all. Same idea. <laughs> you have a decision to trust in what you can do or what God has done. Romans 10 says it this way. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Two things are required to respond to this invitation. First, you must confess with your mouth the lordship of Jesus. And you must believe in your heart that he died for you and rose 
again. The promise of Romans 10, 9 is if you do those two things, if you sincerely confess those words with your mouth, if you sincerely believe them in your heart, you will be saved. The exchange is accomplished in that moment of faith. When the verbal declaration matches the internal conviction of the heart, it's like wedding vows. More and more, you know, when people write their own vows, you, you know, in a TV show or a movie, you hear them say their vows and you're like, they just said nothing, you know? And pronouncing their love or whatever, and then they end with, as long as our love sure lasts, you're like, that's not a vow, you know? It's, it's like ending with, as long as I feel like it, you know? But imagine, imagine a young couple who wanted to get married and they stood in a, in a private room and stared into each other's eyes for a minute and then walked out and declared themselves married, right? We would all look at that and be like, that was nothing. Nothing happened in that room. You didn't say words. You didn't make promises. You had no witnesses. There was no piece of paper, right? In order to get married, there are steps you have to take that involve, involve words that people hear, vows that actually are, have, have substance to them of promises you make with witnesses who sign that this event actually took place. A lot of people in our country, a lot of people in Tampa Bay think they have this personal understanding with Jesus where they've like stared in his eyes and had a private moment at some event, but they've never made their vow. You know, that's what baptism actually is. Baptism is the, it, it's the public declaration of what happened in that private moment. It's, it's going public with what you believe and it's your opportunity to stand up and say, Jesus is Lord of my life. Not only Lord of the universe, but Lord of my life. But when you do those two things, when you make your vow to King Jesus, the promise is you will be saved. And here's the bonus, the final step in understanding and responding to the God's free gift is that you can be forgiven. You can be declared righteous in Christ, perfect in him, covered in his righteousness forever by becoming one with the Lord Jesus. The only place where there's no condemnation. The only place where there's forgiveness is in Christ Jesus by being united with him. Here's how Paul says it in Romans 6. We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is a picture of death and resurrection. You go underwater as a sign of your old self, your old sinful flesh that's dead and buried with Jesus. And you come up from the water as a symbol of your resurrection, that you're united with Jesus, both in his death and in his life. Romans 6, 5, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Everything hinges on that doctrine of being united with Jesus. The only way to have joy, power, peace, eternal life, forgiveness, fullness, significance, and eternal family of God, the only way to have all of these gifts, every spiritual blessing is in Jesus Christ in a personal, committed, covenant relationship with the Lord. And it starts with that very first Yes. The Bible ends with this invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears become a part of the promotional party and also say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, who knows he has a need, who knows he needs to be forgiven, who knows that she needs forgiveness and freedom and fullness and that this world is not satisfying. Let everyone who desires come and take the water of life without price. C.S. Lewis called himself the most reluctant convert in England. He was a young man in his 20s who had been an atheist since he was 16, who served in World War I and saw great carnage and death and convinced himself through what he thought was rational argumentation that there could not be a God because there was so much evil and suffering in the world. But even as a young man, he knew that that premise was faulty because even just by reading things like fantasy books, he knew there had to be more to this world than what science could explain. And through conversation and relationship with his close friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, and another Christian friend, finally, Lewis had his turning point, riding 
on a bus. If you haven't read Surprised by Joy, I'd encourage you to read the autobiography of C.S. Lewis and his description of coming to that turning point. I, I love the, just how mundane that final turning point was. But it was years of coming to that when his heart finally said yes. I wonder for those, those of you here today, if there's something that's been holding you back from saying that first yes. Maybe you would be the most reluctant convert in Tampa Bay. Maybe some of you have a friend like that. Who right now, as you pray for them, as you think about that, maybe you even invited them today and there's some reason they couldn't make it. Never lose heart in praying for and reaching out to those people because you, you know God continues to work and one day the time will be right for them to respond. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible invitation that you've made available to the entire world, to everyone who is thirsty. You say, come. Here's the living water. Here's the water you can drink and never thirst again. Here's the water of the Lord Jesus that you can drink and it will become in you a spring that will well up to eternal life. You've invited everyone who will just admit there's a struggle inside of us. I desire to do what's right, but I can't carry it out. Everyone who recognizes the reality that I'm a sinner, I fall short of your glorious standard, Lord Jesus. And so I come to you humbly asking you to forgive me, to take you into your forever family. I recognize there's nothing I do. I, I can't do anything to earn your favor. I'm worn out from trying. But I want to come to you today and just place my faith in you, Lord Jesus, and what you have done. Just a matter of confessing with your mouth, just saying, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Lord. You are the Son of God. I believe you died for me and rose again. Lord, we're, we're amazed by your grace that through that simple yes of faith, you take a sinner and pronounce them righteous in Christ. You take a slave and you set them free in Christ. You take one who is chasing after the things of this world and bring them into your kingdom. We're amazed by your grace and so thankful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.